And if you look up at the overhead, we're in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Then we'll be going to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. So those of you who have your Bibles, and I hope everyone does, you probably want to We'll want to go to Revelation first, but also while you're at it, find where Isaiah chapter 9 is, because we'll be pivoting to that here in just a moment. In chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 14, we're going to read just the first verse where Jesus is telling the church at Laodicea who he is. Verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Father, I ask you now to take control of my thoughts and my words. And Lord, we know that by your Spirit, Lord, you speak to our hearts. Jesus, you said, my sheep hear my voice. So Lord, as we're going through your word this morning, we know very well that it's by your spirit that you speak to us. And even those who are online watching, Father, wherever they might be and or here, Father, it's by your spirit that you speak. So Lord, give us listening ears. Let us hear what you have to say. So Father, I Pray against any disruptions or distractions during our time so our hearts can just hear from you. So, Lord, we we pause. We quiet our hearts right now. And we ask you to speak to us. And it is in Jesus Christ, our Lord's name, that we pray. And everyone said together. We have made our way through the entire Bible. We're now in the book of Revelation. The thing about God's word is simply this. You couldn't make this stuff up if you tried. You have the same message in 66 books written over a 1,500-year period, 30 different authors, three different languages, and the story remains the same. And it's God's word to us. So much has been lost with the Christ Mass, or what we call Christmas story. So much has been lost. We don't even do Christmas shopping anymore. We just don't, you know what, it's, we, you know what me and my wife's Christmas present to each other is to have our family over and have a big meal. So we, we pay for the meal, Maggiano's, and we, we pay, for, and that's our gift to one another because it's become We have lost the real reason why we're celebrating this time of the year. How many would you say that's true? The other side and truth of that is we celebrate Christ Mass every Sunday. (laughs) It's just, and it's like Resurrection Day too. It's like, yeah, we celebrate that every Sunday too. And um, it's like Christmas every Sunday and Easter, which is named after a false idol, but the resurrection of Jesus, we celebrate that every Sunday. And what you'll see is the Christ Mass story is all throughout Scripture. And so it's no different this, than this morning. We're, here's what we're going to do something a little different. We're in the book of Revelation. We're going to look at this church of Laodicea next week. But we're going to look at is Jesus' introduction to the church this morning. Because in that introduction is, guess what? The Christmas story. So we see here in verse 1, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. As you know, the book of Revelation means the, is a, the word is apocalypse in the Latin, which means the uncovering or it's the future of the world. But Jesus wants to address the church before he gets to what's going to happen in the future of the world. So in chapter 1, Jesus tells John, write what you see. Write with the things which are, and then the things which will take place after these things. So he gives an outline, the things which you see, the things which are presently, and the things which will take place afterwards. That's, that's chapter 1, verse 19. So John is pinning these words. He sees Jesus in his glorified state. 
Then Jesus says, okay, I want you to talk to the church. Seven churches, I'm going to have you pen these letters. Now, as we're going through these letters, and there's correction all throughout it, the question I want to ask myself is, number one, does this apply to me? Do these corrections apply to me? Then, as a pastor, does it apply to the congregation of Calvary Chapel? Because it, the one thing about following after Jesus Christ is this. You've got to be teachable. You've got to be correctable. Because I don't know about you, but about once or twice every day, I need a little bit of nudge. I need a little bit of correction. And, and I've been a Christian since I was 16. Now I'm 59 years old. And my life with the Lord has been one of encouragement, of mercy, of grace, of compassion, from the Lord, but also of correction because I so easily get off and the Lord corrects us because he loves us. So when we go back to the very first letter to the church at Ephesus, he tells the church at Ephesus, you guys are tearing it up. It's wonderful, but you, you're missing something. You've left your first love. You've left the reason why you're doing what you're doing. Why are you serving me? And it should be out of love for me. And so I look at that and I go, oh my goodness, Lord, does that apply to me? And frankly, it has applied to me. And then to the church at Sardis, just one of the two churches we've looked at so far, um, or actually we looked at, at six of the churches so far, but at the church at Sardis, he says, you look great from the outside, man. You have a reputation that you're alive. The world looks outside and in, and man, you guys, you guys got it going. You got the fog machine during worship. You got the lights. You got the kicking band. You got everything just happening, but you're dead. You become a corporate church is trying to please the world. You're spiritually dead. And we never want to get to that point, ever. And then Jesus warns them, hey man, Strengthen those things that remain because you're about to die. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So somehow the church at Sardis com completely through their journey had lost the reason why they were there. So as, as a Christian, I want to ask myself the question, okay, does that apply to me? First of all, personally, individually, but does it apply corporately to, or, or uh, as a congregation at Calvary Chapel. So when we go through God's word, we want this to apply to us. Amen? If there's an encouragement, we want to grab it. If there's a promise, we want to claim it. If there's a correction, we want to ask the question, is that me? I tell you what, if God gets just a handful of people like that, and he's got them here in Lincoln County, he'll turn this county upside down. And that's what we want. We want to see tens of thousands of people in Lincoln County come to Jesus Christ. Amen. We want to see, we want to see the God's small g, the God's of addiction and sexual perversion in this county wiped out. And the way that happens, listen, there's only one way that happens, and that's one heart at a time. It only happens by one change heart at a time. You know, we're going to have a marriage, uh, a marriage uh, refresher in January, uh, February rather. And I love marriage refreshers. You can learn, you know, what, what the differences between man and women and the spouse. And there's some good stuff to glean from that. But I always step back and I just go, you know, Lord, you get the heart of that husband. He sells out to you and you watch that marriage just blossom. And then the wife's heart sold out to Jesus Christ. And guess what? Jesus is at the center of that marriage. And guess what? All those problems that were there, the Lord just gets in there and he heals and he fixes them. Amen? So really you want disciples of Jesus Christ working in our hearts. So at this church of Laodicea, he tells them who he is. He introduces himself. He says, number one, I'm the amen, the faithful the true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. So there's these four things he describes himself as. Just as he did last week to the church at Philadelphia, if you look in chapter 3, same chapter, verse 3, 
Look how he describes himself there. He says, these things says he who is holy, he who is true. Now, folks, I want to make a point that I pray I make it clear enough. It's a simple point, so if it doesn't come across, it's my fault. But I think it's really important. Holy means separated. Separated from sin. So you can actually have a holy act that if you're tempted by sin and you choose to obey God and you choose to say, Lord, I want to walk by your spirit, not by my flesh, that is actually a holy act. Are you with me? Because you're separating. Okay? We're declared holy because of Jesus Christ. We're declared blameless because of the cross. Amen? Truth is very similar. Truth is separated from lies as well. That's why Jesus Christ, when he came, he said, I've come to declare truth to you. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am light in darkness. I, sh I show you what's true. Stay with me. So he's come and he's speaking to Pilate and he says, those who hear my voice know the truth. So now you have these two kingdoms in our world. You have the kingdom of God, which you belong to if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, a kingdom that declares truth. Then you have the kingdom of this world, who the father of this world, the God of this world, if you will, not the father, the God of this world is the father of lies. So what you see in our democracy, our republic, for the last two or three years is the clash between truth and lies. Where no one even knows what the truth is anymore. Where a truth can become a lie and a lie can become the truth. And when a culture goes that far, you are in serious trouble. Be, be, because what you have is, oh, this happened. No, that didn't happen. This is a, no, that... And I tell you what, probably one of the biggest mistakes we made is allow attorneys to become politicians. Nothing against attorneys, nothing against them. But what attorneys can do is what they, an attorney is, you hire an attorney to represent you and to win your case, even if you're guilty. Are you with me? To represent. So we have all these people in, in politics right now that are just arguing to win their case, not the truth. That is dangerous. But you belong to the one who declares truth. So truth, watch this, is in a sense holiness. So the holy and true one. So that's how he identified himself the Church of Philadelphia. Holy, separate, and true. So when he says here in verse 14, watch what he says. He says four things. These things says the amen. That word amen, when you say amen to someone's prayer, does anybody know what that means? Huh? I agree or so be it. Right. There's an idea of agreement. There's an idea also in the Greek word is a firmness. In other words, so be it. I agree. This is the truth. So what Jesus is saying is, I am the amen. In other words, it all stops here. I'm the amen. It's going to happen. There, there's no bending. There's no yielding. And then he says he's the faithful one. The idea of being faithful is he doesn't change. God is not like me. I can be grumpy before I have my coffee that I'm really gracious after I have my coffee. And if I'm ever grumpy, just give me some coffee. And I'll become a really nice guy. Until my blood sugar drops and then I'm in trouble again. That was funnier than you're giving me credit for. <laughs> but now watch this. He doesn't change. So the way that Jesus dealt with people is the way he's going to deal with us. Now, if you look at the stories the accounts of Jesus dealing with the lost. How did he read the Gospels? It's amazing. You know, in our Band of Brothers meeting, which we're going to start back up in February, we're going to have a Tuesday morning and a Tuesday night so we can get more of you guys in on it. 
you just read the story, the, le- the red letters of Jesus. It's amazing what you, what you grasp. But there is a story when you think of Jesus dealing with a sinner, someone who's lost, really lost. The first thing that comes to my mind is the woman caught in adultery. And really, this woman caught in adultery is all of our stories, whether you know it or not. Because here's the real crux of the story. This woman is caught in the very act. Now, imagine the self-righteous, very religious leaders of their day. They, they dressed the right way. They had the right... They, they, just were, they catch this woman in the act of... In case you catch a woman in the act of adultery, first of all... You, you, Imagine the shame that's going to happen. They come in the room, I mean in the act, there you are, get dressed, you're going to die. Imagine the fear, imagine the shame. So in my mind, and the scripture doesn't describe it this way, in my mind, this woman is hurriedly dressed, she's being brought, and you can just hear religion and i'm when i say religion this is what i mean man's attempt to become righteous in his own self I, i'm keeping the rules i keep these rules and if you don't keep my rules then you're not quite good enough and if you don't keep the rules like i keep the rules then you're not in our club that was religion that's religion today that's what i'm talking about so they bring this woman to jesus imagine i, I, I can see in my mind's eye i don't know why i see it this way her hair is pulled Get over here, you adulteress, you prostitute. Get over here, you know, just pull and maybe even punch her. So maybe a little blood trickling down her lip. And she's thrown before Jesus and she's just waiting to die. I want to ask an honest question. And I want to honest answer. Uh, answer honestly. Have you ever been put in a position where you thought you were really, anybody, really going to die? Few people have. I tell you what, I almost drowned two or three times surfing. And one time I was drowning and I thought I was saying goodbye to this world. I was, I was about 14 years old and I was saying goodbye because I kept getting pulled under, pulled under. I come up for a breath and the, it was a really freak wave set that came in and it kept pulling me under. I'd get up just to get a breath and it pulled me right under. And I'm going, I'm going, I, you know when you start losing it? You know, in your mind, you start doing a gulp. You guys know what the gulp is? Few people do. If you hold your breath for a really long time, your esophagus does, goes like this, because mm, 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 you're desiring air so much, I started doing that. Mm, mm, mm. Right after that, you pass out. I was gonna die. And I knew it. I'm, I'm going to drown out here. And I was by myself and my buddy, or my buddy's surfing, but the wave set was so big, we were both lost in it. So this woman is coming. She, she's about to die, and she's just waiting for the first stone to hit her. And the, the self-righteous religious men of Jesus' day asked Jesus a question. The law says, the law of Moses says, if you're caught, if you're an adulterer, you have to die. What do you say, Jesus? So they're trying to trap him. The only problem is the whole thing was a setup, as you all know. We've been through this story many times. It was a setup because if she's caught in the act of adultery, and the book of Deuteronomy, rather, both were to be stoned, you can't commit adultery by yourself. So a man was involved. So it was a setup. Jesus knew it was a setup. So they bring this woman before she's just think, just imagine you're this woman, your head's down, you're waiting for the first rock to hit you, the first stone to hit you. And I couldn't imagine dying by stoning because it's going to be painful before you get knocked out. It's going to be painful. Then you're going to be semi-conscious as you're just crushing your skull. Jesus doesn't answer their question. The thing with God is this. We can ask him all kinds of questions and he'll answer the one question he won't answer is a dishonest question. He won't answer a dishonest question. If you have a real question for him, if you're really at, at that point in your life, like, Lord, I need guidance. I don't understand. He'll meet you right there. But if it's one of those, he won't answer. He'll just remain silent. And that's what Jesus did. He remained silent. 
Then Jesus' answer was he knelt down and he wrote in the sand. Can't wait to get pull that DVD out in heaven. What was he writing? What was he writing? How about thou shalt not bear false witness? That's what those guys were doing. What if that's what he wrote? I don't know what he wrote, but what if that's what he wrote? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Then he asked them, he who is without sin, just get it started. Just get it started. Just one of you. One of you never had to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice for the covering, the temporary covering of your sin. Anyone who, if you haven't sinned, any one of you, just go ahead, get it started. Then the scripture says something amazing. From the oldest to the youngest, starting with the oldest, it began to drop the stones. It wasn't the youngest to the oldest because most young men aren't really self-aware. The older you get, the more understanding you realize, golly, you get a teeny bit of wisdom. So one by one, they begin to drop the, drop the stones. So that's how he dealt with the lost. But he also told them the truth. Woman, where are your accusers? She looks up. She, I'm, I'm about to die. They're not here. Neither do I accuse you. Now go and sin no more. In other words, it's not that you go back right back in that lifestyle. I don't accuse you. Now, she would have heard the gospel. She, she would have been around the gospel. I'm sure she would have probably become a follower after Jesus at that time. But, but neither. So that's how Jesus deals with the lost. How does he deal with the self-righteous? That's the second category of people he dealt with. How did he deal with the self-righteous? He had the most scathing rebuke for them. Again, those who think they're good enough by their own works, their own good deeds to make it to heaven. He had the most scathing remarks for them. He said, you're going to hell and you're sending others to hell because you're teaching them by keeping the law, you're going to get into heaven. This is on a deep, deep level so troubling for me. Because if you were to stand outside every congregation in America today and ask every Christian who is in church on Sunday morning, how do you get to heaven? How many would say, by being a good person? I think many. I've told you guys this before. I've been to a lot of funerals. I've done hundreds, but I've been to some. And I've heard a preacher get up there and say, well, we know where so-and-so is because they were a good person. I want to run up, take the mic, and go <clears throat> on their head. What are you talking about? What gospel do you read? So Jesus deals with the lost very compassionately, but he tells the truth very lovingly. He deals with the self-righteous. He rebukes. because they're, But how does he deal with his disciples? Because that's what you and I are. You're a follower after Jesus Christ. You're a believer. You want to become a disciple? Here's how he deals with us. Watch this. He's very patient with his disciples. Look how he deals with them. But he also tells them the truth and he'll correct them. He'll tell them the truth, but he's patient. He's compassionate. He's, and he explains things when they don't understand. That's what a disciple is. And that's what you and I desire to become. We want to become his students. We want to become his true followers, not just believers, but disciples. A believer is someone who makes Jesus a part of their life, invites Jesus on their journey. A disciple says, no, Jesus, you take over. I'm following you because you're the one who created me. You have the answers. I don't. And then when all is said and done, I just want you to say, well done, well done, thou good and faithful. I just want you to say that. I don't want you to go, oh, it's you. <laughs> we have a place for you. <laughs> Although if I'm going for the alternative of in heaven and the other place, I'll take that too. So that's how Jesus deals with pe people. He's faithful. So now, folks, as followers of Jesus Christ, stay with me on this point. As followers of Jesus Christ, the trajectory of our lives, now we'll have bumps in the road, but the trajectory of our lives should be faithfulness to him. 
like I said, we're going to have bumps in the road. Da, 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 that's not my point. The trajectory should continually be being faithful to him. Now, when we're faithful to him, we listen to his voice, we obey, and then he begins to use us, watch this, as salt and light wherever we are. Now, let me say, as I look at the church of Calvary Chapel, the congregation of Calvary Chapel, and the church as a whole in Troy and in Lincoln County, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Because here you have a small, medium-sized church and orphanage, um, the Oasis ministry, uh, um, pregnant women ministry, ministry to women that are coming out of, of, of uh, incarceration and discipleship and feeding people weekly. I don't know how many doing it, 40, 50 a week now, Kenny, approximately. So doing all of these things, and that's exactly what we should be doing. And if you look at the history of the church, stay with me, this is vital. Because I, 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 look at, I look at the way the world looks at the church. And, and we're seen as you guys are just, have blind faith, you guys are uneducated. All of these things, this kind of anti-intellectualism. But the truth of the matter is, does anybody know that the university system, the college system in America was founded by, guess who? The church. When you have Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, those were seminaries in order to train men to share the gospel. Now they're cemeteries. The hospital system in America around the world was founded by, guess who? Christians. Guess who's educated more people in the last 2,000 years? Guess what institution? The church. Guess who's helped more people, poor people, than any other, it's the last 2,000 years, than anyone else, any other institution, the church. And you may say, well, why don't we hear about that? Because CNN is not going to tell you that. The church can do it a lot more efficiently than the government can. The government will spend millions of dollars to get a food program in Africa. The church comes in for $10,000, does the exact same thing. But you won't be told that. Church, are you with me this morning? This is so important. The edu- so it's not anti-intellectual to be a follower after Jesus Christ. In fact, it's the most reasonable, logical thing. What about evolution? Oh, oh please, really? Do you guys know, this is crazy. You know how you, do you know how your nerves work? How your nerves work. Few people know how the nerves work. There's this thing, you have nerves. You you, you touch, let's do an experiment. Just just stay with me on it. Take your finger. Everyone put their finger up like this. Everyone put their finger up like that. Okay, put it in your nose. No, don't do that. Okay, so put your finger like this. Ready? Touch your face right there. You know what just, can you feel it? Okay, let me tell you what happened. You have nerves that have these synapses, these little gaps and these nerves send an electrical current. When you touch it, you feel it on your face, sends an electrical current from the tip of your finger to your, to your um, spinal cord and the, your face. Electri- electrical current, electrical current. Where did the electricity come from? Electrical. Your heart is beating through electrical current. Did you know that? Funk, 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 funk. And if that gets messed up, you're in trouble. That elect- so. Watch this. It runs on the nerve ending. It sends an electrical current. But as it sends that current out, it goes through that synapsis there. But there's something in that nerve that it has to have in the DNA, has to have a perfect, watch this, perfect balance of fluid. Otherwise, the nerve burns. That electrical pulse going through would burn the nerve. But also, right after that electrical... Uh, a current goes through your nerve to your umbilical cord to your brain to tell you you can feel that touch there. It sends a deadening, a dampening enzyme right through the, the nerve. Why? Because what happens when the electrical current goes here, it, the tendency would be to bounce back and burn the nerve. That, watch this. It would go and burn it, but it sends a dampening 
um, I don't, I forgot what they called it, so that the, the electricity can't come back. Otherwise, if you did this, it would continually go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It'd be like, ah, don't touch me. But it, it dampened it. Are you, are you with me on this really simple illustration? Are you guys with me? How did that evolve? How did that evolve? And, and so you were created. So, so it's, it's, it's just crazy, this idea. But, but it's not anti-intellectual. So, so we should stand for what's true, guys. Absolutely. The church, the church is not anti-intellectual. Who's been the greatest defender of human rights? What institution since the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Oh, you won't be told this. The church. The church. By the way, it was the Republican Party that did away with slavery. The Democratic Party wanted to keep it. Interesting. Did you guys know that? You guys know why the NRA was started? I'm going to get myself into trouble. You guys know why the NRA was started? Anybody want to take a wild guess? To arm former slaves in the South against the Ku Klux Klan. Because in the South, they wanted to take uh, firearms away from the African Americans. The NRA was founded so they could have their rights to carry arms. You guys want some truth? That's the truth. Now the NRA is the big bad, big bad bully on the block. And I'm hearing a few coughs. That means I don't agree with you. <laughs> no, I'm, kidding. I'm joking. Let's move on here before I get myself into further trouble. So watch this. And then he says a true witness. Look here in, in verse uh, 14, a true witness. That means whatever Jesus said is going to be absolutely true. And then here's what I want us to see. Beginning of the creation of God. Now, look at that phrase there, beginning of the creation of God. doesn't mean that Jesus was created. That's not what it's saying. People will look at that and cults will say, well, Jesus was a created being. No, this is a Jewish idiom. It's a Jewish phrase, meaning all creation was through Jesus. All creation came through him. And so here we have the Christmas story. Why did Jesus, stay with me, why did Jesus come to earth? He was the one who created us. Now the creator now becomes part of the creation. Why? Because a penalty had to be paid. Well, wait a minute. And this is where Muslims get, I've shared with Muslims before, and they'll say this to me. They'll say, well, why couldn't God have just forgiven us? Why did his son have to die? And that's a good question. Why couldn't God just say, done, I forgive you? Here's the reason. God is loving. God is righteous. God is compassionate. God is holy. And God is just. And here's the thing. When you have laws and the Ten Commandments, the law, if you break a law, a penalty has to be paid. Just like in our jurisprudence. Just like if you go to court and you're, you get pulled over for speeding, you go to that court and the judge says, you have to pay a penalty. There's a penalty to be paid. And if the, if the accusation is worse or you've done something worse, you've stolen or, or something, murder or whatever it is, then a penalty, uh, justice rather, demands a penalty. So couldn't God have just said, okay, I'll just waive the penalty. He can't waive the penalty, but he paid the penalty. Justice has to be met. He, wa he didn't waive it. Watch this. Jesus didn't even take on the penalty. He became the penalty. And there's a huge difference, folks. Just let that sink in. Jesus didn't just take on the penalty. The Bible says he became sin. There's a big difference. He became sin? What? He had to take our place. What? The God man? You mean a man couldn't have paid the price? No. Only God could have paid it because everyone else has fallen short. There's no other perfect man. There's no other perfect woman who could pay it. It would have taken a perfect being to pay the price. That's why. 
And that's why it's ridiculous for us to say, I'm going to get to heaven by being a good person. What I am literally saying then is, Jesus didn't pay it all. <laughs> he didn't pay it all. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It's one of those hard books in the Old Testament to find. Go to Matthew, go left. Zechariah, Amos, Hosea, Daniel, Ezekiel, then Jeremiah. Keep going. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. We're all familiar with this verse. For unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Now, look at that for unto us. That's an individual, but also collective. So unto you, unto the world, a child is going to be born. In other words, he's going to come into this world like everyone else does through the birth canal of his mother. Unto us a son is given. So it's going to be a male child. But look at that word given. That word given means assigned. He's going to have a task to do. So this is the Christ mass story. Unto you a child is going to be birthed into this world and a son is going to have an assignment and the government will be upon his shoulders. In other words, he is going to rule this world. Now, folks, I, I, I shared this with the first service and it's just this PG-13, so I want to warn you. But when you think about Jesus coming and ruling, um, trust me, the nine-tenths of this world that is really, really, really good news because nine-tenths of this world live in countries where there's such great injustice you couldn't even comprehend it. In America, you have no idea how blessed we are, even though we're, we're getting stuff pulled apart, but how blessed we are to have laws. We're ruled by laws, not by men. And I hope that remains the case. But we're ruled by laws. Most countries are ruled by men. And men can be evil, especially when they're given power. Complete power. They, 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 will, they will totally take advantage of their country. And if you're their enemy, you die. But Jesus said he's coming back. He's going to make all things right. Now, as Americans, we listen to that and we go, cool, because we see things happening now that aren't right. But I want to share with you, in the, in the 80s, um, we would get these reports, well, as I worked with Voice of the Martyrs, of things, horrific things are happening around the world, I mean, detailed stories and reports. And, and um, the thing is, God sees all of these atrocities. He sees all of them, and they're happening all the time. And there was one thing that just really just stood out and, and I'm going to ask you to 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 um, bear with me on this. This is going to be really hard to hear, but I, I want you to grasp some of the horrible things that are happening that Jesus is going to come back and make right. It was in the Congo. One of the things the rebels would do, they wanted to to, um, to just gut their enemy is they had round, round, round up all the pregnant women in a particular village. They would take out the children from the womb with a knife. They would toss the children in the air and catch them on their bayonets. It's much worse than that. It's much worse than that. And that happens all the time. But you don't hear about it. Your sisters around the world today, because they're Christians, living in countries where it's illegal to be a Christian, will be raped. Gang raped. Because 
after a believer. So, when this child is born, the son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, he's coming back, and he's going to make it all right. He's going to dispense justice. He's going to rule his millennial reign, which we'll talk about more when we get into the book of Revelation. His millennial reign, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's not going to put up with that anymore because every cry of every child, every scream of every woman who's suffering, a man who's being tortured, he hears it. He hears it. We don't. So what we want to do in Troy and in Lincoln County is we want to be salt and light to our county, changing one heart at a time, right? Just one heart at a time, praying. That's why this Harvest 2020 is so important, changing one heart at a time because we can be salt and light in our community. And when I get to heaven, I want to, the Lord to be able to look back at Calvary Chapel and go, you know what? You guys prayed. The Holy Spirit moved in this particular house and they saved the mom and the dad and the children and, and I restored them and I took them out of fear and, and addiction and, and oppression and all these horrible things because you guys stood up and prayed. Is that what you want to hear? That's what I want to hear. But the government is going to be upon his shoulders. Then his name will be called Wonderful. And, and this word wonderful in the Hebrew just means marvelous. And, and there's just no other word, I mean, that can be used. It's just like, okay, so how do we describe this son? How do we describe this child? He's wonderful. Then he's a counselor. Look at that word counselor. It means to give advice, to consult, to counsel. So does anybody ever need direction or advice on what to do in life? Yes. Do you think God has the answer? Yes. And here's the deal. deal. He'll either speak to you directly to your heart or he'll speak to you through others. And if I'm, I'm in a pickle or I'm in a situation where I need guidance, I'll say, Lord, I need your help. Then I'll call godly brothers and I'll say, what do you think about this? Usually the elders, what do you think about this? What's and then I'll begin to listen to God's word. I'll ask my wife. And normally, nine times out of ten, I'll, I'll run it by Sharice, and the first words out of her mouth, I'm going, because it's the Lord speaking. you got to have those godly friends. And you also got to have godly friends that will tell you the truth if you're wrong. No, I don't think that's a good idea. Oh, Raz, I didn't want to hear that, but okay. I've lived this Christian life long enough to know it's a good idea just to listen to godly advice. Amen? So, so he's a wonderful counselor. He is, and then it says this, mighty God. Okay, so now we're not just talking about a, a son, a child that's born or a son that's given. Talk about God himself. Then everlasting father, prince of peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So now we have this scripture that was written 700 years before Jesus is born. The ones who read the scriptures knew this was going to be happening, but, but mankind just does what it does. It goes on its way, its merry way. But now watch this. The angelic realm, the demonic and the angelic realm, they're waiting for this day because they know the scripture. Satan's waiting for this day and his demons because they know the scripture. The angels around God's throne know this day is coming because of the scripture. And here's where the real Christ mass story happens. In Luke, or I, I skip, just go ahead and skip over that, Paul. That's one scripture. Skip over that one. Just go to Luke, please. But sorry, guys, I did it. No, you can just click on Luke. Sorry, guys, I got off track. Luke chapter one. Go ahead and put up the first one, please. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Bless are you among women. Now imagine you're this virgin. She's engaged to be married. She hasn't known a man. An angel shows up, 
and makes this pronouncement to her. Go on, next, next one, please. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now, we looked at Isaiah but, and about the promise of the son being given, but the, actually the prophecy goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, right after man fell. God tells Satan, Lucifer, and Eve, he says, I will put enmity or hatred between your seed, Eve, your seed. She doesn't have a seed, but it's, it's just her offspring. It doesn't say Adam and uh, a man and woman's offspring. He says Eve's offspring. So it's going to be the offspring of a, a female, thus a virgin birth, and the seed of, of Satan, which is the demonic realm. And I'm going to put hatred between you two. And he's going to crush your head. He's going to crush your power. So that prophecy is actually given in Genesis chapter 3. And then there was, it was more detail was given in Isaiah. Next verse, please. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. Continue the Christ mass story. She was brought, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now check this out. This is amazing. The Son of God chose not to be born in a Hyatt Regency hotel, not at some resort place in Maui. Could he have been? Answer, yes. But there was no room even for the local place in Bethlehem, so he had to go to a manger where there were animals. So can we just dispense of this false gospel that says God wants you rich? Can we just dispense of that? Because the Son of God was born in a manger with animal dung all around him. That's our king. What an example. Does that mean God doesn't want you to have a nice house? No, I guarantee you everyone here has a nice house. If I'm to compare you to the rest of the world, everyone here is in the top 3% of the world in economics. I wish I was rich. Trust me. Just go to Africa or Sudan with us. You're rich. Take you to Somalia. You're rich. So important that we see that. that that's, this is our Savior coming. Next point, next verse. Now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock. Now the, sh the scene shifts from a manger to a field, and these shepherds are out there just hanging out. Now, have, do we have any campers here? Show of hands. Do you guys have any campers here? You know when it gets really, really dark you know, and you see the stars? You feel a little vulnerable sometimes. I always bring my Glock. But I'm kind of like, if I hear a coyote, I'm kind of like, eh, I hear a coyote. Or you hear the raccoons. Have you guys heard any raccoons ever come? They have this funny noise they make, and they just all kind of come in. And they want your food. I'm like, don't come over here, Mr. Bandit Man. So they're all out there, and guess what happens? They're watching their flock, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. That's exactly what I would have been. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. So we move on here. Sounds like someone's being tortured back there in the nursery. <laughs> Speaking of babies in a manger. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Next verse. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace and goodwill towards men. I'm tempted to end the service right now. Can you guys hear that? It's like, oh boy. We really don't torture our kids in the nursery. Uh-huh. Oh boy. I don't know why I'm just so distracted by that. Yeah, somebody want to go? Can moms just rush back there and, and unchain that child? There are three moms just took off. We're gonna, and grandmas too. Cut two grandmas, one mom. So that, that will be good. I just, you're talking about a baby being born in a manger and you're hearing this screaming. You're like, huh. Now I don't know how to close. How do I close? Pray. This is the Christmas story. We good?
Child okay? Okay, good, good. All right, just change his diaper. he will be all right. This is the real Christ mass story. This is why Jesus Christ came. And from the very beginning, God had to step in to our, from eternity to the temporal. So now he, he grows to be a man. Watch this. He, he has a man's body, but he's God. So a man's body and he's God, and then he becomes the penalty for us, having lived a perfect life. Then he dies and he resurrects from the dead. This is why it had to be God. This is why it had to be God. Because only God has power over death. Jesus resurrected himself from the dead. How many of you know that? He said, I raised myself from the dead. Only God can do that. Man can't do that. Only God could. So Jesus comes for us. He, the Bible calls him the second Adam because the first Adam sinned. That was a scripture I skipped over. The first Adam sinned. Sin was passed on to all of us. And the second Adam came, the Messiah. The second Adam came and la la leads us out of this mess. That's literally what he's done. That's the Christ mass story. Amen? Let's stand for a word of prayer.